Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of the SSI Spotlight on Cannabinoids. My name is Brian Hainlein. I'm the NCAA Chief Medical Officer, and it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you. So this series will highlight the changing cannabinoid legislation and policy in collegiate athletics, including the Committee on Competitive Safeguards recommendation to remove cannabinoids as a banned substance and to move more toward a harm reduction model for prevention, identification, and management of problematic cannabis use at the college campus level. And we're really highlighting the 2022 Summit on Cannabis and Collegiate Athletes, which provided foundational statements that were consensus-based regarding the current scientific and consensus-based evidence on cannabinoids and collegiate athletics, and also implementation strategy statements. And these consensus and evidence-based statements serve as a foundational guide for schools to better support student-athlete mental and physical health, safety, and performance. In our previous session, we discussed the current scientific and evidence and changing norms around cannabis use. And today, we're really going to take a much deeper dive, focusing on what really the harm reduction model, harm reduction implementation looks like at the cannabis at the campus level. Uh, we're joined by Jason Kilmer, who is an associate professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington. Jason was also a member of the 2022 summit. And Nadine Mastrolio, who is an associate professor of psychology at Binghamton University, Nadine was also a member of the summit, and she's a member of the Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sports. So Jason and Nadine, so nice to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. And maybe if we could start, Nadine, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and how that's relevant to today's Spotlight Series. And then, and then Jason will ask you to do the same. Sure. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, Dr. Hainline. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I'm Nadine. I am an associate professor in the clinical psychology department at Binghamton. And um, one of my um, areas of research happens to be college student athlete substance use. Um, it started in the area of alcohol use um, and have, have moved more into the use of cannabis um, and then the co-use of cannabis and alcohol with their effects overlapping. And so my work at Binghamton um, also kind of stretches into the athletic realm as I serve as a faculty athletics rep. Um, and I'll just mention I've had um, a background in college coaching and athletics as a past Division I um, women's basketball player. So um, that's me, and I'm really excited to to get to share some of the information that we've been talking about here today. Uh, Dr. Hanline, thank you very much, Nadine. Great to get to tag team with you. Um, my entire career, I've been a part of uh, research surrounding the development implementation and evaluation of brief interventions around prevention and intervention, uh, really involving alcohol use by college students, cannabis use, and even other drug use. And importantly, it's the way in which we work with students on those issues. I was trained by Dr. Alan Marlatt, who in the late 1980s was really the first person on college campuses to say, could we look at harm reduction based approaches? And so my whole career, I've been a part of um, testing those harm reduction approaches as well as implementing them. Part of my job involves doing direct uh, work with our student athletes, um, and I have the chance to do that at other campuses across the country as well. Well, thanks, uh, Jason and Nadine. So let's start off, maybe Nadine, just for the, for the audience, describe broadly speaking um, what harm reduction is, especially with regard to alcohol, cannabis misuse, and and, and how we can start thinking about that model. Yeah. Um, so, you know, harm reduction is, is essentially as it's, as it's labeled. Um, the goal there is to reduce harm associated with whatever substances individuals are using. Um, in the context of student athletes and cannabinoids and cannabis, one of the areas here is it's not necessarily to say you can't use you can't do things. It is more to understand where the individual is coming from, what their reasons are for using, and then help them move into a direction where, where any choice around use is really not harmful to them in any form of consequences. So, you know, thinking of um, many of the things that could happen related to cannabis use, it would be trying to make sure that those things don't happen to the student athlete and really helping that individual understand that 
choices they make along the way will potentially result in different problematic issues, um, different problems in general. And our job, honestly, is to work with them kind of in collaboration, in truth, um, to help them understand those things and make some decisions that really don't involve problems at the end point. Well, thanks, Nadine. So, Jason, you know, you talked about really being at the ground level for harm reduction models. And so maybe walk us through that. Was that a, a, a remind us again when that first started coming into into play? And was that really? a radical was that a radical concept at the beginning that we're moving away from punishment or abstinence to harm reduction? Absolutely. It was it was very bold. It was not where we were as a field, and it's honestly not where we were as a country. If you look in 1988, the number of published studies on college campuses showing success in reducing drinking or related consequences, there weren't any. According to the Reagan National Library, we had 12,000 just say no clubs. So that's where we were. I always love when I hear people say, we've been doing harm reduction forever. I mean, not really. Um, if there's a misunderstanding of harm reduction is that it's somehow anti-abstinence or that it equals moderation. And nothing could be farther from the truth. If someone says, I want to avoid all of a substance's unwanted outcomes, then don't use it. Abstinence is the most risk-free and harm-free outcome. But what a harm reduction approach acknowledges is that any steps towards reduced risk are steps in the right direction. And so, you know, if someone is under 21 and the main harm they're trying to avoid is a legal one, they may decide maybe abstinence is what I need to do. Um, we always are very mindful when we're delivering a harm reduction message to not give a mixed message. It's again, it's not equal moderation. It's not, you know, do whatever you want. Um, if you're under 21, it's illegal to use. If someone says, I want to avoid all of the substances, unwanted effects, absence is the best way to do that. If they make the choice to use, we can talk about ways to do that in a less dangerous or less risky way. We don't say in a safe way. And we're very careful not to feed into misperceived norms. If a provider stands up in front of a group and says, look, I know you're all going to use. So if you do do this, I know you're all going to use as a misperceived norm. And that's just that can have an unintended impact in the in the wrong direction. Yeah, so that's that's very interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit more, Jason, as well? And I know you've done a lot of work in this. What does perceived norms mean when we're talking about use of cannabis on, on a college campus and and how that's important to understand? In the late 1980s, apparently everything good happened in the late 1980s in our field and in music, to be clear. But uh, in the late 80s, a number of norms researchers, Alan Berkowitz, Wes Perkins, Jeff Linkenbach, Michael Haynes, Corrine Johannesson, all started documenting that there were pronounced misperceptions of the prevalence of alcohol use. That when people thought everyone uses alcohol, they're more likely to start. And those that drink are more likely to drink more frequently, even at a higher amount and even experiencing consequences, such that if you can correct a misperceived norm, not for everyone, but for some, it will lead to actually making changes in their own behavior. That research started a shift in the late 90s, early 2000s to cannabis. Sandra Wolfson is a researcher that showed that the most pronounced misperceptions of cannabis use come from those that use most frequently. If you have a student that uses every day, they're convinced that all of your surveys are wrong, because everyone lies on those surveys and everyone uses weed. They really don't. And so, um, you know, if most students aren't using, getting that norm out there is appropriate because those that don't use will know we've made the choice that most student athletes have made and or most people at this campus have made. For those considering making a change, you could actually support and boost their confidence and optimism that change is possible if they realize lots of students have chosen to not use. Um, so often they worry, well, what if I quit and I'm like the one person not using at the school? So we do know that misperceived norms can absolutely be associated with people's own decisions and behavior, and we have an opportunity to correct those in the prevention work that we do. Yeah, that's great. So so Nadine, here's another uh perception or misperception and and you're look all the work you do on committee on competitive safeguards and medical aspects of sports so the committee made the recommendation to remove cannabinoids as a class from the banned substance list for the NCAA drug testing program and some of the reactions that we received we meaning the NCAA the committee on competitive safeguards was oh this is really a wrong message because now you're basically saying smoking weed or doing edibles is fine and, and we're not concerned about it anymore at championships. Yet, 
you were really saying the exact opposite in, in, in many ways. You were saying, one, it doesn't make sense to test for cannabinoids because that's not a performance enhancing drug. Two, the strategy was a failure in terms of doing anything meaningful from a harm reduction point of view. And three, the message really is we're even more serious about cannabis use because we're very concerned about the potential mental and physical health problems that can develop. So long-winded question, but Nadine, kind of walk us through your thinking representing the Committee on Competitive Safeguards, how removing cannabinoids was not about saying pot is fine, but it was saying something very, very different. Yeah, I mean, that's 100 percent correct. And, and you know, as I as a member of that committee and, and as the current chair of the drug testing subcommittee, we had, you know, countless conversations about this over months um, using is the best data we could have from drug testing, um, the best information we had across survey data and also truthfully watching the national landscape um, and, and the way in which cannabis and cannabinoids was being shifted um, at the legal kind of national level. And we really took a, what I would argue is a full 360 approach to taking a look at what is in the best interest of our student athletes. Your point about them um, not being um, performance enhancing was a huge piece, right? That is a big charge on our committee is to make sure that that's one of the, the things we do look at as far as um, how an athlete may be influenced um, by a substance. But the other part of it was, you know, as you mentioned, I think in point two, that, you know, the the testing strategy we had was not necessarily impacting um, use rates at that point. And in fact, we still currently have that drug testing policy. And if you look at the rates from the most recent NCA surveys, right, the rates are continuing to increase um, partly. And I believe this is because we've really allowed people to know it's okay to answer those questions honestly so that we can do a good job of helping make sure that we actually put into kind of play opportunities to help them. So one of the things that um, our committee is is really focused on is helping people understand that testing at championships was not really a deterrent for using substances. Um, and in truth, that was where the cannabis testing was, was happening. Um, Sure, individual campuses absolutely do regular testing of their athletes at random times. We actually do believe that that's a strategy that can be helpful, but it's a, it's a strategy to be used to help identify individuals that are really in need of more resources and more support. We have shifted, and this was, I think, two years ago. Um, there are no more you lose your eligibility punishments. It is completely education-based. It is completely focused on what that individual needs to make sure that we, you know, as an institution, and I will argue as a membership, are able to help the individual with what they need. Um, and a lot of times that is just helping them understand the way Jason just described those norms, that not everybody is actually using cannabis and helping them understand that it's okay to choose not to do that. And in fact, that's a great choice, truthfully, for most people. Um, and so what we've really tried to do is shift away from putting a blame or a negative stigma on things and helping students understand that there are ways that we are there to support them. Um, and, you know, I, I know this will probably come up later in our conversation, but, you know, our committee is putting together a, what I would argue will be an incredible opportunity of education and resources for use, you know, for use by institutions. Um, kind of not clearly a roadmap, but really mapping onto some of the things you all have done in the past around alcohol use. So, um, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to really focus on the student athlete at the center versus the substance as the center. Um, and by doing that, our opportunities to help individuals who need more support and need help will be there a lot more easily. Yeah, that's great. And maybe maybe one follow up, Nadine, recall that we, we had data when we used to penalize athletes who tested positive, and so then they were out of sport for, you know, it was a year, then six months, and so forth, that we have no data that that actually helped the individual from a cannabis use disorder point of view. Um, and we also have pretty good data that the vast majority of those students never returned to sport. So, And that was, I, I had a feeling you were going to go to that last piece where, in fact, is that detrimental to an athlete who has a strong identity? identity as an athlete, that athletics actually really is a huge piece of who they are. It keeps them 
academically focused. It keeps them connected to their teammates and to a really good structure that they've had probably their entire life, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, so from that perspective, um, that approach, um, and I'm not suggesting, you know, it's what we knew at the time. Um, and what I've really been proud of as a member of the um, committee is that we've really, um, what I would say is evolved and taken science to help us make decisions. So all of our decisions have been completely scientifically driven. Um, and that, you know, that summit was unbelievable. Um, and so the opportunity to pull that information, to use that to make our final decisions um, has been, you know, I think um, policy changing, but also um, life changing for a lot of these athletes. Yeah, well, I I would say your decisions are scientifically driven, and they're also driven by this enormous passion for putting the athlete center, as you said. Um, so, I mean, Jason and Nadine, talk to us a little bit about some educational strategies at a, at a broad level. Nadine, as you said, CSMAS through SSI will we'll be putting out some sort of uh, uh, operational guidance for, for all the campuses, but what are generally speaking some educational strategies? I think that what's hard about a question like that is that, you know, at universities, at college campuses, we're all about education, yet education only, at least with alcohol, doesn't have the impact and outcome that people are often rooting for. Um, David Hansen, 1982, published an article. I'm just going to keep citing the 80s as much as I can. But David Hansen published an article that showed that when you give college students facts, information, knowledge about alcohol, they learn stuff, but it doesn't necessarily change their behavior. Subsequent research showed Information has its place, but it's delivering it in a motivational framework. Nadine and I have both been a part of research looking at Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick's motivational interviewing, which is a non-judgmental, non-confrontational approach that really highlights meeting people where they are in terms of their level of readiness to change and tries to find the hook for them. And it tries to elicit a personally relevant reason to change. What's in it for me to make a change in my use if I'm a student athlete? And one way we can do that is if we can develop discrepancies between where people want to be and where they're at, goals and values of importance to them, and ways in which the status quo could be in conflict. What's my goal? I want to have the best season possible. What's the status quo? I'm using a substance that actually impairs athletic performance. So we bring in that information within that motivational framework when we do things like brief interventions. Now, that can be done in group formats, but there's a lot less research that's been done specifically about that with cannabis use. I'll, I'll say this, and I'm, I'm curious what Nadine would say too. I mean, with education, it tends to increase knowledge, not change behavior. Honestly, given where cannabis is right now, it wouldn't hurt to increase knowledge. I think that people, we keep hearing sentences like, it's just weed, it's natural, it's safer than alcohol. And the science tells a very different story. And so letting people know the concentrations and potency we're seeing today, the risks associated with health and mental health, the impacts on things like athletic performance, um, even just to level the playing field about knowledge could be a starting point. The researcher in me says you'd have to evaluate the impact of that, of course, but um, it's all part of an overall puzzle. Yeah, and I'll I'll agree with that comment, Jason, about um, education. I you know I I've been I started out as an alcohol researcher and as I mentioned and have really moved um, a lot of my interests into into the cannabis um, use around college students specifically. And one of the things that I am consistently um, seeing is there is just a lack of understanding. Um, and you know I want to expand that because I do think in another piece of that is coaches and administrators also have a lack of understanding. And because of that, and it's to no fault of them, um, you know, it's it's just not out there. We we see things about alcohol all the time. We understand the the concerns around around drinking, um, drinking and driving and those pieces of the puzzle. But, you know, if you remember back in the 80s, um, you know, there wasn't a huge pull towards until that time about, you know, drink drinking under the influence, right? That's kind of when those messages started being pushed out. And now college students know not to drink under the influence of alcohol. Whether they do it or not is a different question, but we do know that that's a harmful thing. I think there's a misunderstanding uh, around the role of cannabis in, in as simple of an example of driving under the influence of cannabis. Um, and I've talked to 
athletes in prior jobs where they said, well, it just makes the drive go faster. And I was like, well, it's still, it's, it's still under the influence. And so the fact that there is that misperception means that I do think a starting point is education. Um, but to also echo Jason, because he and I have come out of the same model, right, of MI being motivational interviewing being kind of a huge component of a lot of these effective interventions, you have to use that um, in some form or another. I think if you are working individually with a person, it is your best model. It works really well with this age, this population. Um, and in truth, it's helping individuals understand things in a way that um, the way I've always looked at motivational interviewing is it creates an atmosphere where the individual wants to pull the information into them and own it because of the atmosphere and the kind of way in which you present the information. So instead of trying to jam education into them, um, I'm a professor, <laughs> I understand this academically. Um, I can't just teach people statistics and make them know it. I have to make them want to know it. Um, and I do think that that's a piece of this. And, and I will expand that to, we do need our coaches and administrators to also want to know that and to be open-minded to the shift of how cannabis works and the impacts it can have on the body, but also not using the old school approach of it is just bad. It's just bad. Just say no. Yeah. And on, on our previous spotlight series, part one on cannabis, it was, it was really pretty remarkable discussing um, the various effects of cannabis on multiple aspects of the central nervous system and, and the rest of the body and really getting into the potency aspect. So um, yeah, this I, I have a feeling these series are are, are going to be uh, really pretty widely distributed. You know, Jason, I'm going to go back to the 80s again. Um, there was a great Surgeon General, C. Everett Coop, and he packed some powerful information. He basically came up with the fact that smoking kills you and smoking causes lung cancer. But that knowledge alone wasn't enough to change behavior. Something else had to take place. And so maybe can you uh, elaborate on that if I got that right, Jason? I mean, it's a, uh, we could have an entire hour just on that topic and I obviously won't do that, but it was uh, James Prochaska and Carlo Di Clemente who are uh, credited with developing the trans theoretical model of change. Some people call it the readiness to change model. Some call it the stages of change model. And they developed that actually in response to cigarette smoking. They said they had never met someone that smoked cigarettes who was unaware of the health consequences right? We don't see people that are like, wait, what? These are bad for me? No one told me. But they're at different levels of readiness to have a loved one, a healthcare provider say, you need to quit. And so they acknowledge that some people change isn't even on their radar. They're not even thinking about it. Pre-contemplation is what they called that. Some people are noticing stuff. Maybe they're ambivalent. I'm spending a lot, or I feel like my memory is not what it used to be. Um, they might be weighing the pros and cons of change, people in contemplation. People have said, I'm going to make a change uh, at the end of the month. Um, New Year's resolutions, for example, would be an example of this, are in preparation. People actively making a change, action. People who made a change six months or more ago are in maintenance. When we ask people to just say no work, everyone laughs. And when we ask them why, they give us lots of reasons. We think just say no doesn't work because it's an action stage request. You're telling people, do this. And if they're in pre-contemplation, or if they're in contemplation, there's a disconnect between what we're asking for as the program provider, the student affairs professional, the coach, and where that student or group of students may be in terms of their level of readiness to change. What that means is just say cut down, just say moderate, just say use in a less dangerous or less risky way would honestly be as equally dismissible and equally laughable a goal if it's asking for action in people who aren't there yet. And the data back that up. So our job, we can't, we have to be non-judgmental. We have to be non-confrontational. We can't tell people, go do this. But we need to get people thinking, if I wanted to make a change, how might I do that? And why might I want to make a change? And that's where this all fits in within this motivational framework. A oh, great explanation. Uh, so let's get to some uh, definitions and, and, and then how we work with this. So um, we are using a term now that uh, I can tell you when uh, I was in medical school uh, way back when was not an official term, but now we have cannabis use disorder. So what is cannabis use disorder? 
one of the last students I saw before we went virtual um, at the start of the pandemic was a student that came to me and said, I think I'm really addicted to weed. And I said, well, how can I help you? He said, by letting me even know if that's a thing. My roommates keep telling me you can't get addicted to weed. It's not addictive. And we're doing people no favors when that message gets out there. It's a very addictive substance and risk of cannabis use disorder is a, a very real thing. And that's not new. Uh, in the DSM-4, which we used up until 2012, we made a distinction between substance dependence and substance abuse. Um, in the case of alcohol, it was alcohol dependence, alcohol abuse. For cannabis, cannabis dependence, cannabis abuse. When the DSM-5 came out in 2013, the terminology changed, and there was an overall substance use disorder, and it specified based on the substance. So there are clear criteria for cannabis use disorder. In many ways, it takes a number of the symptoms that were associated with dependence and abuse and, um, and merge those. Um, but based on the number of symptoms a person endorses, they get a rating of mild, moderate, or severe. And uh, again, this is one that we could take forever going through, but it includes things like developing tolerance. When someone says, um, you know, I used to be able to use this amount and feel it. Now I don't even feel that. I have to use a lot more or more often. I mean, experiencing withdrawal when they stop, um, there's a very clear set of criteria for a withdrawal symptom. So if someone says, um, whenever I stop, I get headaches, I get anxious, I get depressed, I can't sleep. It must be helping my anxiety, depression, sleep. And no, that's it's withdrawal. And so we're, we're looking for things like this. And the good thing is, is that um, we can make sure people are aware of its addiction potential. And there are even tools we have for screening for things like this. And, and Nadine, as, as a psychologist and, you know, you're, you're, you do so much at the campus level, what are some of the things that you see in athletes or, or students who are not athletes even that have problematic cannabis use? Yeah, um, it's interesting, Jason, as you were talking about um, one of the students you saw before the um, our shutdown, um, I was also working with a student similarly. Um, and that individual came to me specifically because he had decided it was taking over his life. It was ruining his relationship with his partner. It was impacting um, kind of the way in which he got up in the morning. It impacted his athletic performance. Um, and one of those pieces that was he came to that conclusion, but people around him had already noticed it and it already said something to him. So, you know, what it looks like in real life, um, I, I do think it's it's very different across the board. Um, back in a previous career when I was in student affairs in an alcohol and other drug office, um, I had a student working with me that um, tried to figure out a way to use cannabis to not get caught in the residence halls. So he would go down into the canyon um, to smoke. Um, now this was in a, um, in San Diego where there are a lot of rattlesnakes. Um, and I reminded him that that's potentially more dangerous than getting caught for, for smoking in his room. Um, you know, but it was making his life revolve around when he was going to get to use. Um, so the combination of things like impact on relationships, um, impact on teammates, um, and our athletes where, where they're, realizing that that individual player teammate might rather go use than spend their kind of time together doing team bonding things or going to dinner or doing what they used to do, kind of pulling away. Um, and then the other part of it, um, which I think is, you know, clearly in the diagnostic, but finding reasons to move your life around so that the use of your substance, and in this case, smoking pot or cannabis or whatever, was more important than, um, in that example, not getting it by a rattlesnake. Um, you know, he did get poison ivy though, right? So it's like, you know, the idea there is like he was willing to sacrifice having poison ivy because he wanted to make sure he used his substance because he thought that he needed that to get his day started. Um, so that's the piece that I think um, I look for is when I hear little things about how they're adjusting their life to fit the substance versus their life kind of running and then the substance sometimes kind of pops in and out. Right, right. So talk to us about the relationship uh, between cannabis use, problematic cannabis use and other mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, um, uh, sleep disorders. I mean, Jason, you 
you sort of made mention to it when when you uh, said that well, when people are withdrawing, they may be yes. getting anxious or depressed, and so they they think the pot is actually helping them because when they smoke the pot, they're less anxious. But talk about because uh, they're treating the withdrawal. <laughs> talk to us about the relationship between problematic cannabis use and say anxiety, depression, sleep disorders. Still uh, stuck on the fact that Nadine has warned people about rattlesnakes, which is something I've never had the chance to do in my position. Nadine's winning completely for those keeping score at home. Um, I was part of a team uh, of researchers from the University of Washington and Washington State University who, at the request of the state, uh, looked at what the science says about the high potency products, the high concentration products that very much seem to be the more common product nowadays. Um, to see, could we all agree on what the science says? And we actually did come up with a consensus statement where among the things we looked at was that the more often people use these higher potency products, the more they are at risk for a range of unwanted outcomes, including related to mental health. There's research that shows that daily use of cannabis over 10% THC increases the odds of developing a psychotic disorder 4.8 to 5.8 times compared to people who don't use it all. If you're rounding, five to six times compared to people that don't use it all. Um, you see more onset of generalized anxiety disorder. You see uh, across the board, the risk of uh, mental health issues going up. You brought up sleep. On the one hand, onset of sleep will, will seem more rapid when people use cannabis. Cannabis has sedative, sedating, and hypnotic sleep-inducing properties. But we can ask people on nights where you use cannabis, what do you notice about your sleep? And they'll tell you, I sleep hard. I sleep and I mean it. And I don't dream. What they're calling sleeping hard is that deep sleep gets extended. Why don't they dream? No REM sleep. And so the quality of sleep gets really messed up to the point that the next day we see increases in sleepiness, anxiety, irritability, and jumpiness. And it's not like you just have your one rough night's sleep. This is where cannabis is kind of the gift that keeps on giving. If someone uses uh, a second night, those effects are additive or cumulative. But if they take a night off, the body plays catch up. The person goes through REM rebound, which is associated with an increase in fatigue. Think of how many mental health issues on college campuses are exacerbated by or include diagnostic criteria surrounding fatigue, anxiety itself, low energy or sleepiness. And so, uh, especially with as much as on the plates of student athletes, anything that can actually worsen anxiety or impact quality of sleep in an adverse way, we'd got to believe would be seen as not very attractive. And so, um, I mean, as more and more research comes out, the list goes on and on and on. And, and Nadine, if I recall correctly, uh, during the summit, it was noted that for those who are, you know, taking cannabis on a very regular basis and they have uh, anxiety or depression, that the ability to effectively manage or treat the anxiety and depression, either from a, 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 a psychological perspective or a pharmacologic perspective, is actually it's less efficacious. Yeah, um, completely. It's um, interesting. I was looking at my slides from um, the the summit. And that was one of the ones that um, I, I re-pulled up and reread and, and looked at a few things in preparation for this conversation. And yeah, the concurrent use and using um, cannabis with for individuals that have anxiety and depression disorders, essentially it, it does, it's associated with greater severity. Um, and, you know, I think of it as um, a mechanism of coping in many ways. Um, individuals believe that that using cannabis is an effective coping strategy. Um, you know, when, it, when I think of what some of our research has shown around why athletes say they are using cannabis, it is somewhat for enjoyment, right? Um, they do use it to, to spend time and hang out with their friends and that sort of thing. But more often than not, it's to kind of take a time out in many ways from the stresses of, of being an athlete, being a college student, being a young adult, to be honest. Um, and so when you kind of combine um, an individual that has anxiety or depression that is maybe already um, more predisposed to try to use a substance to cope, um, and then you add the opportunity of, of cannabis into the mix without them understanding all that stuff that Jason just said, um, you know, it, it, it fakes them into believing it's helpful. It fakes them into believing that it's helping them sleep. Um, and in truth, it's, it's what he just described doing the exact opposite. And so I think, 
Um, it is really important. Um, again, we go back to this understanding and education. Um, our athletes need to understand that, but also so do coaches. And in very truth, um, mental health professionals. Um, not all mental health professionals are fully equipped to understand all the ins and outs of cannabis use, partly because it's evolving science. Um, and it's um, there's a lot of work we can do across the board there to, to really help individuals um, make those connections for their athletes that they're working with. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. So um, let's talk about uh, drug testing at the campus level. So we remove cannabinoids um, as a banned substance. We're no longer testing for it. But it doesn't mean that we're saying don't test for cannabis. So how do we develop, say, a targeted program where drug testing might be a really valuable in a harm reduction model? Yeah, um, you know, and I, again, as I mentioned, the, the subcommittee group that um, I, I have the opportunity to work with has really been focused on how do we still consider that um, and help campuses consider that as an effective, helpful tool in their process. Um, you know, and in truth, it, it is an expense, right? It costs some money to be able to do that. And um, I've had conversations with a lot of different athletic departments, my own included, where the conversation is, well, do we really need to do that? <laughs> um, so obviously the answer will be no from an overall standpoint, there will be no requirement, but um, our committee has really come down on the line as it is really a valuable tool in the process. Um, understanding where individuals um, fall. And again, um, you know, reg like intermittent use, like once a month or once every few months isn't really a concern. It's the kind of chronic users, the folks that are using kind of pretty consistently um, that we want to be able to, to kind of know who those athletes are so that we can actually work with them to help them um, to make sure that it is not moving towards cannabis use disorder in that matter. Um, you know, not every heavy user will kind of continue on to the use disorder category, but some will. Um, and to me, as somebody who really does believe in prevention, um, catching that early and is important. Um, and in truth, we actually have tools to do that, right? It's a, a pretty simple urine screen. It is not that expensive. Um, and we're able to, to kind of use that as, as one piece of the puzzle if you will, to, to kind of identify individuals more at risk. So final thoughts for uh, Jason and, and Nadine. Uh, you know, we have 1,100 schools. The majority of the schools on the NCAA are Division three. And whenever we put out best practices or recommendations, we're always thinking about the fact that many, many schools just don't have the resources uh, that some of the, you know, the top Division one schools have. So just talk to us in your final comments about how a harm reduction model, harm reduction strategies can be utilized for by every campus, uh, regardless of your resources. Maybe talk to us at that general level like that. I appreciated Nadine's point about uh, pieces of a puzzle. And we talk about that a lot. Um, for alcohol, we have the College Alcohol Intervention Matrix, or College AIM, from NIAAA, which is the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And they rate over 60 individually and environmentally focused approaches for how we impact college student drinking. We don't have that equivalent tool for cannabis. Um, more research certainly needs to be done. And honestly, it's been as the product itself has changed and as ways that people can use has changed. In some ways, it's been so moving that uh, research really has had to play catch up. And, and in my feeling, research has caught up. In College AIM, my single favorite sentence is that a mix of strategies is best. Absolutely. That mix includes, but is not limited to, policies, but then enforcement of those policies. Um, education, prevention, intervention. For those that need support in making a change, potentially treatment. And then once people have made changes, recovery support. All of that, all of those pieces are essential. I think the other thing to keep in mind to your question of how can campuses, you know, be mindful of being impactful with potentially a limited budget, certainly go where the science says. And um, if there are strategies that aren't effective, uh, don't go that way. If there are strategies with either promising data supporting those, that's actually certainly worth pursuing. I, I, and, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, the best article we point to 
um, that gives guidelines for lower risk cannabis use. The title alone is important. They don't say here are low risk guidelines. They say lower risk guidelines. And they say that's because if you look at the science, there is no safe level of use. Any use incurs harms and risks. So if people make the choice to use, it includes you know, recommendations like using lower potency products when possible, um, being mindful of the method of use. They say if people insist on using, finding a method other than smoking, keeping use occasional. They define that as a day or two a week, weekend only. So if someone says, I only use every other day, that's pretty high frequency use and very high risk use. If people notice effects on cognitive abilities, stop. And if stopping is not realistic, substantially reduce frequency and potency. I'm presenting to you from a state in which drug driving deaths outnumber drunk driving deaths. That's heartbreaking to me. They make very clear if people inhale, they need to wait six to eight hours before they even think about driving. If it's oral ingestion, eight to 12 hours. And lastly, they say there are some people that might want to avoid cannabis use completely or at least significantly adjust their use. Who's that? People with a first degree family history of or who are actively dealing with psychosis, a mood disorder, or a substance use disorder. So if someone's already struggling with anxiety, depression, cannabis might not be a great fit for them. And I think that that science five years ago wasn't there it's there now and on a college campus we're well positioned to bring that science to the students we work with the only thing i will add to that is um you know we have great partners on all college campuses um you know i want athletics and folks in athletics to to really understand that the folks in student affairs and alcohol and other drug offices and whatever their their your campus might call that that area they actually want to partner with athletics and they want to be helpful. Um, and, um, you know, the I look at it as a two way street. But in truth, if athletics um, is looking for more support outside of the stuff that the NTA will pull together, outside of the stuff that's on the national scene that, um, you know, you can link to different articles on um, college health assessments and things like that. There really are great partners on campus that are well poised and ready to go, if you will. Um, I've met with a number of people across the state of New York who are literally asking for athletics to come ask them for help. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for the folks that are watching and um, kind of in that position where they're looking for those resources, please don't be shy to ask and reach out to um, whoever your director of health promotion or health education or alcohol and other drug services or whatever those offices might be on your campus because they know your campus well. They also know the ways in which your students are engaging outside of the things maybe that the folks in athletics know. Um, and so it can really be a, a perfect um, kind of collaboration between groups. It doesn't add more work to athletics. Um, and it does connect athletics to the overall campus, which I know all of our athletic departments want to do. They want to be integrated into the community um, as a part of the campus and not just kind of over on the side um, in the event center or whatever um, offices they have. Well, great. So, look, a huge thanks, Nadine Mestrolio, Jason Kilmer. Uh, really appreciate you being with us today. Your insights are phenomenal. And... Um, Look, if any of you out there have questions, comments, you can always reach us at ssi at nca.org. So thanks again to our guests and looking forward to the next time. Thanks, everyone.